And are you one of those heartlanders that I've heard about that is lurking in the bushes? <laughs> yeah. Ready to steal my children's testimony That's from right. Mesoamerica That's and right. drag them kicking and screaming up to the narrow <laughs> neck of land in Ontario in order for them to lose their testimony in Tumbaga <laughs> and only find it in Zelf in that mound? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you've, you've exposed me. What can I say? I'm spending money like I just got paid. Hundred dollar bills, tell them keep the change. Come on. It, you really have to massage the text to have it fit Central America. Yeah, pop a bottle about to make it rain. Let me give you something now to celebrate. Come on. Hard to say they don't mention the three J's that I call them. Jaguars, jungles, and jade, right? And if you're wondering why I move the way I do, I just feel so good. Lots of people have theories about Book of Mormon geography with Camorra, New York. It can be, some people say it's all in Western New York. The whole thing took place in Western New York. Some people say the entire Eastern United States to the Mississippi with Zarahemla being across from Nauvoo okay. in, in Iowa. Other people even say, well, Central America still fits with it. So the following is an episode of Ward Radio and does not represent the thoughts or the opinions of KHTS, its owners, or any of its affiliates, nor does it represent the official opinion of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. With that said, sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. So good. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I am your host, Cardinalis, and today I am joined in the studio, fresh off the plane from Auckland, New Zealand. We got none other than Jonathan Neville. Uh, can we call you controversial artist uh, at you large? You can, even though I'm, I don't try to be controversial. It's just the nature of the topic, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and well, actually, speaking of topics, I have actually not chosen a topic yet to start out with, but I asked our Discord, okay? Mm -hmm. I actually asked all of the members of our Discord what we should talk about, and I put up on the Discord, all right? I said, hey, guys, I actually have Jonathan Neville in the studio right now. Wild, huh? And I got some really cool answers back. I said, what should we talk about, all right? And Ethan says, oh, cool stuff. Did Joseph Smith use a seer stone? Nitz Walsh says, ask him about lemurs. <laughs> Another guy says, what's your favorite color? Okay. So we're going to definitely ask you what your favorite color is, all right? But then Ethan comes up saying, how far can we take the connection between Salt Lake City and Zarahemla? I didn't even know there was a connection between Salt Lake City and, and Zarahemla. And then finally, um, asking you to explain some of these heart Heartlander connections and when Jesus is coming. So if you can answer when Jesus is coming, that would be good. We'll save that for the end. We'll save that one for the end. Okay. <laughs> okay. As well as Hopewell Armor. I don't I don't know what this is. So anyway, okay. Jonathan, tell us who you are. Why are you so controversial? Why are people asking me to ask you about Hopewell Armor and when Jesus <laughs> okay. is coming? And what, what do you know about lemurs that we don't know about lemurs? Just introduce yourself to our audience. Tell us what's up. Well, I'll man. start with lemurs. So uh, some years ago, my wife and I lived in Africa. We lived in Mauritius. And we visited uh, Madagascar and hung out with lemurs. They had them climb on our heads and everything. But while I was in uh, Ma Mauritius, one of the guys in the ward there uh, approached me and said he, was, he heard I knew something about Book of Mormon geography. And he said he had been on the internet and researched it, and the Mesoamerican thing made no sense to him. And he, but he'd heard a little bit about the North American setting. And I said, "Oh, okay. really?" So we ended up talking about that. Rock on! And it turned out he was a political cartoonist in the local newspaper in Mauritius, in the capital there. And he had done several books that they even use in schools there about the history of Mauritius. So I said, "We ought to do a book together." And so I brought a copy here to the studio today. To yeah! show everybody. Here it is. Okay, what's it say? What's it say? It's called Lemurs, Chameleons, and Golden Plates. Oh, you got to hand that to me. I'll put it up on okay, the screen okay. so everybody can see it. Uh, the, the subtitle is An African Perspective of the Restoration of the Gospel. So here you go. Oh, wait. So uh, the Heartland geography model is not good enough. We've got an African one now, too? Or what? what's going on <laughs> well, here? This is the Africans explaining the Heartland model. Oh, so yeah. it's like Inception, like a dream within a dream. There you go. Right? There you, you know? go. That's right. Okay, so the book, you can see it right here, is Lemurs, Chameleons, and the Golden Plates. And okay, I'm just, dude, I've so, never seen this before. Yeah. Keep going. Well, the idea of it is that uh, African culture has a lot of gospel principles built into it. Okay. It, their respect for their ancestors and so on. And so he kind of told his story about how he joined the church and his family and how he went on a mission. And we adapted that to... Um, have grandparents explaining the restoration to their children, their grandchildren in okay. Africa. 
And so interspersed in there is the whole narrative of Joseph Smith and how he found the plates and and how that the Book of Mormon came about. Dude, this is cool. And this this political cartoonist is good. He's kind of got some modal Yanni vibes here. He, the he's long really faces. good. He's he's won an international awards for his work. Okay, so lemurs, chameleons, and the golden plates, an African yeah. perspective on the restoration of the gospel. Okay, so um on the on the inside back cover there's a picture of him. Oh, ah, okay, that. cool. Him yeah, and me, because I wrote the script and he it did all the illustrations. William Rosoinivo. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Wow, he was born in Madagascar in 1975. Okay, yeah. so so what's your big claim to fame, man? Are you one of those heartlanders that I've heard about <laughs> that is lurking in the bushes, <laughs> yeah. ready to steal my children's testimony that's from right. Mesoamerica that's and right. drag them kicking and screaming up to the narrow <laughs> neck of land in Ontario in order for them to lose their testimony in Tumbaga <laughs> and only find it in Zelf in that mound <laughs> what is <laughs> you you've exposed me what can i say <laughs> yeah so what what is this whole thing okay man? The whole, what is this whole the thing, whole deal man? is years ago i was writing I've, I've written some novels and i wrote a novel about native americans recovering their land under treaties and someone read it and said you got to meet rod meldrum i'd never heard of rod meldrum before okay yeah and so i went to meet him and he said oh this is interesting you need to know about the heartland and I said, well, what's that? Because I'd been following the Mesoamerican stuff for decades, right? Because yeah. I went to BYU, had a class from John Sorensen, and I you, knew You Jack were righteous. Welch. I was righteous. Not, not a Jack Mormon. I, I was a follower. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how righteous it was, but I was certainly a follower of these guys. Okay. So Rod told me, he said, if you want to understand this, you've got to come on a tour of Ohio. And I said- I thought to myself, well, I've never really been to Ohio. I've been all around the world for business and, and vacations and stuff, but I've never really been to Ohio, right? Okay, right. So on. he said, come on this tour. And I thought it sounded fun. So he and was the tour leader. Yeah. And he took me to these museums in Ohio where I saw head plates and, and breast plates and all the things talked about in the Book of Mormon. Okay. And I thought, well, this is amazing, but how does it fit, you know? And I said, the other thing I asked him is, how did we ever get involved with Central America? Because I'd been to Central America several times, and I'd been very dubious of Book Mormon connections down there okay. after having visited there. And he told me it was because of these articles in the Times and Seasons in 1842. That, really? Yeah, the people, it, it said that the ruins in the Mayan ruins were left by the Nephites and stuff. And everybody assumed Joseph Smith wrote those articles. So that's where I first started in my exploration and all this. I hadn't done any writing in church history previously, but as I explored it and, and tried to figure out who really wrote these anonymous articles in the Times and Seasons, okay, yeah. it led me to a guy named Benjamin Winchester, and I wrote a whole book about it. And it was really my first exposure to LDS scholars and their intransigence and their their adherence to their ideas. Wait, are you suggesting that similar to the Smithsonian and American archaeology, <sighs> that there is an elitist class of gatekeepers who are more focused on preserving a narrative than preserving the true past of a people and that you have come head to head with these folks <laughs> and that sometimes the evidence doesn't back up the narrative and they've chose censorship and aggression instead of curiosity and fact finding and truth seeking. Well, I wouldn't put it that bluntly, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so here's okay. my question. Is it true that they check your voter registration when you go to the firm foundation? And if you don't vote Republican, you can't get in. Uh, that would be true if it was in Africa somewhere. Maybe, no, I'm but, <laughs> <laughs> no, totally no, I. Th that's a, that's a funny thing, you know. There there is a perception of Heartlanders as being kind of these right wing Republicans, but like uh -huh, I mentioned, yeah. this this dude in Africa is the one who approached me because he yeah. he had done his own research on the internet and said this Central American stuff doesn't make any sense. And I can give you lots of other examples of that. Well, then no, no, let, let's do that. Actually, just okay. really fast. Yeah. Top. Uh, uh, top of your head here and i'm sorry you are more than just your heartland theory yeah okay yeah. but it I is the it. number one thing that people i get will it. be asking sure. me. totally we'll, we'll get into the fun and other it stuff came up later. In discord and so yeah, yeah and okay. it came with the discord give me really fast because i actually haven't had a chance to interview a lot of heartlanders yeah. in fact you're kind okay. of the first one in the studio right okay yeah so um i uh, i would i would say what are your top three evidences that kind of made you lose lose faith or credulity that's a great word yeah credulity it, yeah credulity in uh the mesoamerican model okay and what are your top three so what are your top three against 
the Mesoamerican model, and then top three, four, or top couple. It doesn't have to be three. Okay. But what are your top few against the traditional Mesoamerican model and your top few for for your Heartland model that you seem to espouse so openly? Yeah. Well, th- I guess uh, for me, one of the defining issues was this letter number seven that Oliver Cowdery wrote that a lot of okay. people don't know about because it, it isn't widely published. I'm looking all. it up right now. Letter number seven. Letter keep seven. going. You can go to letter7.com and it goes to one of my blogs. And we're using Roman numerals. Okay. And so Oliver Cowdery was the first one to write a history of the church. And he wrote eight essays that were published as letters explaining the history of the church. And part of the first one is in the Pearl of Great Price now in Joseph Smith history. It's a note to Joseph Smith history. Okay. That's that's it right there. Well, yeah, you're so, right. Look at that. And you, there's a link right there on the right column that goes right to the Joseph Smith papers where everybody can read this for themselves. Okay. And so he wrote this letter and, and he was one of the things he was trying to do was respond to the uh, Mormonism Unveiled book that had been an anti-Mormon book published in 1832. Okay, yeah. And that was the one that started the Spalding theory that the Book of Mormon was fiction that Joseph Smith read from behind a curtain or a veil, which is why it was called Mormonism Unveiled. Oh, uh, okay, cool. And so he, one of the evidences that he cited was the fact that Camorra is in New York. So he said that we know exactly where Camorra is. And it, this was the location of the final battles of the Nephites and the Jaredites. And that when he wrote this, he was the assistant president of the church, and he'd been assigned to write this history. And who was this again? Oliver Cowdery. Okay, Oliver Cowdery yeah. wrote this. Okay. No slouch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And it was not hearsay. It was not someone's you know recollection 50 years later. He, he wrote it to be published. Okay. And, and not only was it published in the Messenger and Advocate, but Joseph Smith had his scribes copied into his own journal as part of his history. And then it, Joseph had it republished in the Times and Seasons so that all the members of the church would know about this. Wow. So when I, when I read letter seven, and he said it was a fact, and he described it in some detail, that told me that it, was, it wasn't just some theory that came, was developed by some scholars or some ignorant people. This was Oliver Cowdery, who would know. And then as I started researching more, it turns out that Joseph's mother herself, in her history, wrote that when Moroni first visited Joseph Smith, he identified the hill as Camorra. And so that's where this all originated, the first time he met Joseph Smith. He told Joseph Smith that the, the record is in the hill of Camorra, not far from your house. And go over there, remove the moss and the grass and from this rock, and you'll see the plates. Okay. So that's where it originated. So I thought, well, okay. And, and of course, numerous prophets and apostles have reiterated that Camorra was in New York, including in General Conference, right? And so I thought, well, how do we get in Central America? And it turned out that at some point in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was an RLDS scholar named Lewis E. Hills, L. E. Hills, and he decided that Camorra in New York was too far from Central America. So he developed a two Camorras theory. And he actually made a map. He drew a map of Central America. <laughs> it's, it's funny. I wish I had the map here to show you, but he drew a map of Central America and showed Camorra in Southern Mexico. This was in, he published that in 1917. Really? That was the first thing. And Joseph Fielding Smith, who was a church historian, denounced it. And he said, this idea of Camorra down there is going to cause people to be disturbed and lose their faith. Because the church has been teaching for over 100 years that, for 100 years anyway, that Camorra's in New York. Okay, wait, dude, I just looked this up. Is it this one oh, yeah. that's on the screen? That's his map right there, the 1917 map. That's the 1917 map? Yeah, okay, look at that. Okay, we're going to make this a little bit bigger, dude. We're going <laughs> to make this a little bit See where he put Camorra? Wow, dude, look okay. at that right there. Yeah. Like, that's funny. It's right next to, like, Mexico City. Well, south of Mexico City a little bit, but it's not far from Oh, where... wait, no, no, that's... Okay, I see. No, that's... Yeah, you're right. That's in this most southern part yeah, of... of uh, Mexico. No, that's in... That's actually kind of close to Panama, Honduras, and the Central American country. Well, this is this is all Mexico here still. The whole map is Mexico. Yeah, but I'm saying it's, it's below the central, and it's below the Yucatan. Uh, no, Yucatan's uh, uh, south of this. Yucatan would be up on the upper right. Am I right. looking at this wrong? Okay, no. well, either way. Upper yeah, right. You gotcha. So this, this is where the um, the current Book of Mormon central types that teach that Camorra's in Mexico. Yeah, okay. It's, it's within about 50 miles of where this guy had it back in 1917. So okay. they basically copied his map. Wow. And, yeah, it's unbelievable, this history, how this happened. And, and the reason this guy came up with this was there was a book written in the late 1800s criticizing the— um, the Book of Mormon. Okay. It's called Camorra Revisited, something like that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he said the Book of Mormon can't be true because it talks about two separate uh, 
nations in ancient America, but we all know there was only one. That was in the late 1900s. Oh, that comment didn't age well. Uh, oh, man. Dude, and, then, geez, and that's okay. the irony of this whole thing, because now we know that there were two separate. There were the Adena and the Hopewell that yeah. correspond to Jaredites and Nephites. But this whole two Camorras theory developed because of a mistake in archaeology that these guys were ignorant of in the late 1800s. Wow. So, yeah. Okay. It, it's crazy. So that's the number one thing for me is the letter seven and the teachings of the prophets Okay. about Camorra. Okay. So I thought, well, okay, but there was also this hemispheric idea that Lehi landed in Chile. Yeah. And the scholars decided, well, the whole hemispheric model doesn't make sense because it's just too far of a distance. So they've settled on Central America because of these articles in the Times and Seasons. And I settled on Camorra, New York because that's what the prophets So, thought. So instead of calling you Heartlanders, because I just think of like chunky beef Campbell soup <laughs> when I hear like that. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. What's a better term besides Heartlander? Like uh, North American truther? Like, you know, yeah, and com- what's your uh, slogan going to be? How about a Camorra truther? How's that? Oh, a Camorra truther. A Camorra yes. truther. I like that better. That is so much better. And okay, okay so like the 9-11 truthers, they're, you can always see them coming from a mile away because, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're the guys that always have in their bios on Twitter, like yeah. jet fuel doesn't melt steel beams, right, you know, right. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. What's your, what's your truther Just slogan going to be? The letter seven again. Yeah, just like I mean, letter seven and self thigh bone. <laughs> What do you got to say well, about Zell's thigh bone? I can talk about Zell's thigh bone too. I know. I, I saw your interview with Don Bradley about it. Okay, yeah, and, yeah. And he forgot to talk about how Joseph Smith described they were crossing the plains of the Nephites before they got to Zell's Mound. So it really? wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't just Zell. He said we we crossed the plains of the Nephites when they went from Ohio over to Illinois. They uh-huh. were crossing Ohio, yeah. Indiana, Illinois. And he, he wrote a letter to Emma and said, we've been crossing the plains of the Nephites, picking up their bones as evidence of the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon. So he identified it clearly as a Nephite territory and called it the plains of the Nephites. Wow. So, so okay. Zelf, Zelf was just kind of the culmination of that. And it was a revelation that he had uh, several people recorded. Do you hear that, Don? Jonathan <laughs> Neville's coming after you, man. No, Don, I We're love gonna Don. We're going to have a book off. We're going to have <laughs> a book <laughs> off. I don't know. I don't know if you can handle Don Bradley, bro. Oh, I love Don. That's going up against a Don giant. and I have talked no, about kidding. some really good stuff together. In fact, he's he's helped me. I've helped him on different projects. So. Yeah, no, we're just kidding. We're just yeah, kidding. no, no, I know. So, um, wow. Okay, so this is your evidence for... Well, no, this is evidence for Camorra, New York. That's oh, okay. that's the cool, first cool, thing. Cool. All right. Lots of people have theories about Book of Mormon geography with Camorra, New York. It can be, some people say it's all in Western New York. The whole thing took place in Western New York. Some people say the entire Eastern United States to the Mississippi with Sarah Himmel being across from Nauvoo in, okay. in Iowa. Other people even say, well, Central America still fits with Camorra, New York. So there's a wide variety of opinions about that. Yeah, so, okay. But the the key thing is that the, the Book of Mormon Central types, who I call the M2Cers, and that stands for Mesoamerican Tucumoras. Oh, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> They're Mesoamerican Tucumoras. They reject the Panama, South America, um, Thailand, all the other, Malaysia, all those other ideas. Okay. Because they're Mesoamerican, and they say there's two Camorras. The Camorra in New York is a fake one that Joseph Smith and, and Oliver Cowdery- Where do the armbands come from? Where does like Nephi's cool little like yeah. living scriptures armbands? Is that Heartlander those, those stuff are or Mesoamerican? Both, dude? really. Both. Oh, really? That's, that's kind of an ancient custom everywhere in the world, or, or most places. They have armbands and wristbands and headbands and headplates. And oh, stuff. okay, cool. So that, that's one of the issues with the Mesoamerican idea. They find all these correspondences that they say correspond to the Book of Mormon, but those are ubiquitous to human culture all around the world. So you could find the Book of Mormon. That's why the Malaysian thing you could find. In fact, of all the places in the world that I've been that look most like what the Book of Mormon says, it's in um, Cambodia. You know, the the famous Angkor Wat there? Oh, yeah. They've got depictions of elephants and heaven and hell and lots of wheels, chariots, the whole thing. Of course, it post-states Book of Mormon times. Yeah. But, but if you look at just archaeology, that makes more sense than other sites that I've seen, certainly not in Central America. You know, Central America, it, you really have to massage the text to have it fit Central America. Okay. For example, I, it doesn't talk about the Wait, three Wait, but hold days. on. I'm going to yeah. push back on that. Yeah, bro. sure. I'm going to push back yeah, on that. Yeah, good. Um, 
Here's something that just popped up in my mind because I got to tell you, I'm not mm-hmm. a Heartlander or a Mesoamerican expert. Sure. I've heard amazing and wonderful, compelling evidences of either. And I think both you and I would agree that epistemologically where it happened doesn't matter as much as the fact that it did happen right. and it documents that Jesus is Absolutely. the Christ yeah. and so on and so forth. Right. So with that obvious caveat between two faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, yeah. it is fun to talk about where it could have happened based on the text. And the reason why I've always struggled just with the idea, actually I shouldn't say struggled, but just like I've been willing to say, ah, it could have happened in Mesoamerica, couldn't have, here's the good things for it, here's the good things against it. Right. I'm willing to do the same thing with some of the Heartland stuff that I've seen. Sorry, sure. the Kimura Truthers <laughs> okay. thing, things that go. I've seen, you know? Yeah. I'm willing to do that because of snow. Yeah. Like all these places in the Heartland where people want to say that things could have happened. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get these, like that epidemic of snakes in an area? Like I'm not a herpetologist, but uh, you know, I still have my pest control license. I still keep Uh it up in the state of California, just like people will keep their teaching credential alive. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I still keep mine alive and everything. Yeah. And so I go to these courses and the more that I learn about snakes and pest species of like the insects that they eat and so on and so forth, it, 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 I just find it hard to believe that that snake population crawling out of whatever it is, like third Nephi or wherever yeah. it is, mm-hmm. would just be like in the narrow neck of land between the frozen tundra <laughs> of Ontario and okay. Michigan, you know? And then also they never mention snow in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And I don't see how you would have that polar vortex not get documented over like a 1600 okay. year yeah. period. Like they never mentioned snow once, which makes me think like it couldn't have been in a place with snow or else one of those battles would be fought in snow. <laughs> one of those battles would have been fought in snow, okay. right? All right. So yeah, hit those. I bro. can hit all those. Well, it, okay. I, I I started to say they don't mention the three J's that I call them: jaguars, jungles, and jade. Right, which is all endemic to Central America. That's nowhere in the Book of Mormon. Uh, and okay. so, as far as snow goes, they don't talk about weather except in two or three places. Anyway, you know they say, and they had to wear thick clothing when they were in a battle. So you wouldn't wear thick clothing in in a hot place usually. So that's okay. kind of an implication of snow. And, of course, Nephi used snow as a metaphor, which wouldn't make sense to people that didn't know what snow was. So all those three things, are ah, that's one okay. way to look at it. The other is, you know, there's climate change. There's evidence that parrots were living in the in the Midwest anciently 2,000 years ago, which they can't survive there now, right? Yeah. So there's there's a lot of explanations that we could spend a whole time Yeah, that's wild. About. Even when you go down yeah. to Southern California, like I yeah. go to visit my friends in San Diego, and it's yeah. wild. Like just flying around campus at San Diego yeah, State, yeah. there's freaking parrots. Yeah, and you're just like, wait, what? <laughs> like, hey. no, they've got them in Florida too, right? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But they don't it's have like... them anymore in in Ohio and Indiana, but they used to because there's there's effigies of them there. Wow. So, yeah. Okay. So the the climate has changed. And then as far as the narrow neck of land, that's a really interesting one that I, that I focused on. Because what happened when I came up with the Camorra thing and I realized, okay, Oliver Cowdery said it was a fact. Then we have the uh, issue of how does it all fit, the geography fit. And so my wife gave me a challenge. She made a list of all the geographical references in the Book of Mormon and said, explain all these. So I wrote a whole book. It's called Moroni's America. This is a a pocket edition that I call because people said my original book was too long. So oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did kind of a Cliff Notes version here. And okay. this is, this is a, the most popular one I have now because it, it explains the whole geography real well. Oh, but, dude, I got to read that one, yeah, man. I'll give you this one. You can read this one. Oh, do but, I get a job? Are you going to sign it for me? I'll sign it for you and everything. Dude. So I'll I get, sign it twice if you want. I get the heretical <laughs> Heartlanders there you tome. Go. This is the black book. Yeah, that's of right. Those men that's stealing right. your children back into activity. Actually, what's really funny is I give major credit to the Heartlanders yeah. because- all of the M2C people, you call them, the yeah. Mesoamerican folks, uh-huh. are a snooze fest, bro. <laughs> I know. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah, they I are. watch their videos that are just like, I like literally, they look like welcome videos to the retirement villa that you're yeah. going to check your great grandmother <laughs> yeah, into. They do. You know what I'm well, saying? I, I, I give you credit for watching them because they put me to sleep. Well, so. and, 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 and dude, I get these Heartlanders out there like, check this out, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they're just yeah. like super stoked. It's like watching That's a right. monster energy drink commercial. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I'm going Heartlander. <laughs> if not, just to be excited about reading the Book of Mormon again. Yeah, you know? it is. And it's very eye opening when you, when you, Put it yeah. in a North American setting. It gives you all kinds of new nuances and understanding. Do you hear that, Scripture Central? Yeah, Scripture They're Central. They're courting me. 
They're stealing my Mesoamerican testimony out of my heart. <laughs> well, <Back. laughs> we love the people at Scripture Center. We continually have hope for them that they will see the light and at least acknowledge an alternative. You know, and okay. I, I have a lot of people tell me that they're so glad to have an alternative because their family or friends have lost their faith over the Mesoamerican thing. And, oh, okay, you fair know, enough. So they say, well, here's an alternative. And I've, I've talked to people who have been out of the church for decades, and when they hear about the Heartland, they want to come back. Because oh, fi- they say finally this makes sense. But getting back to your your three reasons, one of another one is that, in my view, when you say Oliver Cowdery was wrong when he said something was a fact, that undermines everything else he said, right? Because if you say ah. here he published this, carefully wrote this whole thing and said these are facts, and now we have LDS scholars saying, well, he was wrong, he was misleading people, he he didn't know what he was talking about, and he was other than him, he and Joseph Smith are the only two that were there for the restoration of the priesthood, the translation, and all the, the temple blessings, all that. So yeah. when we start undermining Oliver Cowdery's testimony, what he said was a fact, that undermines the whole restoration. All right. So check this out. Unfortunately, we got to pay some bills and take a commercial break right here really fast. But you've just said the three top things for the Heartlander and against, you know what? We're just going to take a break right now. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And we're going to come back back. here on the other side of a commercial break. This is absolutely great, guys. Just so you know, we are talking with Jonathan Neville. If you've just tuned in on the radio, we're talking to Jonathan Neville, a prolific author of all kinds of different books and uh, a man who espouses the, quote, Heartland model that we have now just recoined the Kimura Truther movement. (laughs) All right. And we're going to come up with a log line to this movie on the other side of this break. This is FM 98.1. We'll be back in a Feel so good, good, good. Oh, I just feel so good. 